Although incredibly rare, sometimes the unbelievable does happen. Technology in the aviation world is an ever-progressing endeavor. Since the early 1900s, countless advances in technology, from the simplest of concepts all the way up to breakthroughs such as computer involvement in the flight deck and control towers, have helped keep passengers and crews safe throughout the decades. Some hard but invaluable lessons have been learnt in the aviation world, one of these being developing a technology that prevents mid-air collisions. However, the right technology in the right setting doesn't always prevent an accident. This video will document the event in where two airliners, both equipped with collision avoidance technology, collided into each other at high speed in one of the most modern and closely watched airspaces in the world, at night, with a light flow of traffic. Regrettably, mid-air collisions have happened, each time exposing ways in which the industry can move forward and protect future passengers. Since the 1950s, aviation authorities had been experimenting with the idea of a traffic avoidance system on board airplanes. This was later developed into what we call TCAS today, Traffic Collision and Avoidance System, developed in the 1980s. Over the coming decades, all aircraft were equipped with this technology. It works by interacting with another piece of aviation equipment, the transponder. The transponder itself had been around for decades longer, and has been continuously upgraded to compensate for better technology. Utilizing mode S on the transponder, the TCAS can emit a signal from the plane, and when conflicted with another TCAS signal nearby, the system alerts the pilots of the nearby plane. Most times, no action is required by the pilots as flight planning and organization from air traffic controllers means that planes, in more than 99% of cases, are spaced out with at least 1,000 feet of clearing space. It does serve a crucial purpose in the unlikely event that two planes are converging towards one spot at the same altitude. TCAS will give an instruction to either descend or ascend. One instruction is given to one plane, while the other is given to the other plane. We will now discuss the event which occurred over Germany, commonly referred to as the Überlingen Midair Collision. We begin in the Russian city of Ufa, where the local UNESCO committee in Bashkortostan organized a school trip to the Spanish Costa Dorada as a reward for school children doing well in school. Many of the children had parents who were high-ranking military and government officials. As such, a flight was chartered from Moscow to Barcelona on board a Tupolev 154 belonging to Bashkirian Airlines. The Tupolev 154 was the most popular airliner ever developed in the Soviet Union. Developed in the 1960s, these planes populated the skies over the restricted airspace in the Soviet Union and bordering puppet states. Over 1,000 of these planes were built, only being retired from mainstream commercial service in the early 2010s. The plane was impressive, boasting a three-engine design and a sturdy build. The Soviets commissioned the plane to Tupolev so it could specifically land almost anywhere, as many airstrips in the USSR had unpaved or gravel runways at the time. Its strength was very well complemented by its speed and performance, clocking in with a maximum speed of just over 900 kilometers an hour, reaching 86% of the speed of sound at its most efficient cruise altitude. As a result, even after the collapse of the USSR, the many national air carriers forming from the collapse of the Soviet Aeroflot opted to use these planes, as well as other more mainstream European airlines such as LOT and Malev. But this was part and due to the overabundance of these Tupolev planes. On July 1, 2002, Bashkirian Airlines Flight 2937 takes off in the evening from Moscow's Domodedovo Airport, en route to Barcelona carrying 60 passengers, most of which are school children from Ufa. Other notable passengers on this flight include Svetlana Koloya, who is traveling with her two children, Konstantin, aged 10, and Diana, aged 4. They are heading to Barcelona to visit their father, Vitaly Kaloya, who has been working in Spain. The Tupolev this evening is being flown by five highly experienced Russian pilots. Their roles and names are as follows. Captain Alexander Gross, First Officer Oleg Grigoriev, although acting as First Officer, he is actually an experienced captain himself, but his role on this flight was to evaluate the captain. Second Officer Murat Itkolov should be acting as First Officer but is not officially on duty as he is not in the right-hand seat. Flight engineer Oleg Valiev, 
and there was also a flight navigator, Sergei Karlov. Together, all members of the crew have a combined flight experience exceeding 45,000 flight hours. Meanwhile, in the Italian city of Bergamo, a DHL cargo plane is making preparations for a flight onward to Brussels. The flight plan will take them on a route that converges with the Bashkirian Tupolev over the Swiss-German border. The DHL plane is a Boeing 757 freighter. They had landed earlier that day from Bahrain. DHL Flight 611 leaves Bergamo for Brussels heading north. Meanwhile, the Bashkirian Airlines flight is flying west onwards towards Spain. There are just two people on board Flight 611 this evening, British Captain Paul Phillips and Canadian First Officer Ran Campiani. Both pilots are based in Bahrain and together have accumulated over 18,000 flight hours. From 10 p.m. local time, the airspace over Switzerland and South Germany drops to just a few planes, but during peak hours, this is one of the most crowded airspaces in the world. In control of this airspace is air navigation service provider Skyguide. Skyguide are headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, but have a large radar coverage controlling planes that are currently in cruise. Skyguide does not handle individual airport coverage, however they do cooperate with airports and control towers via telephone. Although on the night of July 1st, 2002, scheduled maintenance means that the telephone lines have been cut temporarily, as well as the primary radar displays, meaning that the controllers will be working from a backup system with a delay. Peter Nielsen is among the few controllers on duty that evening at Skyguide. In fact, during the time of the accident, Nielsen was the only controller on duty as his colleague went off duty for a break. Nielsen is then left working from two stations. While controlling the sector that both the DHL and Russian Tupolev are currently flying and converging in, another aircraft comes on frequency at the other station next to Nielsen. Aero Lloyd Flight 1135 is a delayed flight which should have landed hours ago. It's coming in for an approach at the nearby Friedrichshafen airport. Nielsen now has to juggle two different workstations while he deals with the Aero Lloyd flight, taking him away from the radar screen depicting two convergent airplanes in his area. Nielsen cannot call the Friedrichshafen Tower to let them know about the incoming plane, as the telephone systems are down for maintenance. Now would also be a good time to mention that due to the scheduled maintenance, ground-based systems which detect convergent traffic in the air was also turned offline, however Nielsen was not aware of this. Nielsen contacts the Aeroloid flight and tells them to call Friedrichshafen Airport directly on their radio, bypassing approach control. This way he can direct his attention back to his original workstation, where he discovers the two planes converging. A lot takes place in the next few moments while Peter Nielsen makes contact with the Tupolev plane. Tensions are beginning to rise in the cockpit as a TGAS warning sounds advising the crew to climb to a higher altitude. At the same time, the crew of the DHL plane also receive a TCAS warning advising them to descend. If both planes followed the TCAS instructions, the collision would never have happened. However, the Russian crew received another warning from controller Peter Nielsen to also descend. The Russian crew have been presented with a dilemma. As Soviet trained pilots, they were taught that if a controller asks you to do something, you simply do it with no exceptions. However, this is contrary to Western standards, where the pilots are taught to have more faith in their instruments. The Boeing 757 flight manual, Boeing themselves, and the DHL standard operating procedures recommend following the TCAS instructions as a priority, and as a result of not receiving instruction from Nielsen, the DHL crew descended. Contemplating the two choices, the Russian crew also decide to descend. As Nielsen's exact wording was, Bravo Tango Charlie 2937, descend flight level 350, expedite, I have crossing traffic. Believing he has prevented a mid-air collision, Peter Nielsen switches back to his other radar screen to confirm handoff with the incoming flight into Friedrichshafen. Two planes are now flying close to the exact same position, and at 35 minutes past 11 p.m., the two planes collide. The tail fin of the DHL 757 comes in contact with the fuselage of the Tupolev 154, just short of the wings, severing the nose from the rest of the plane. The Tupolev exploded and fell to the ground, while the DHL plane struggled on for six more kilometers without a tail fin. Remnants of the Tupolev were scattered, coming down mostly near the town of Überlingen. 
Many bodies, mainly of children, were also found scattered in the woods nearby to the crash. That is where Vitaly Kaloyev finds his four-year-old daughter's body intact, along with a pearl necklace that she would wear. Kaloyev volunteered in the search operation for bodies. He also finds the bodies of his wife Svetlana, laying in a cornfield, and his son Konstantin. In the aftermath of the accident, debate sprang onwards as to who was to blame for the incident. Sky Guide initially accused the Russian crew for not following the TCAS warning. However, in the end, they accepted full responsibility. On the first anniversary of the accident, Vitaly Kaloyev asked the head of Sky Guide to meet with the controller on duty that night, Peter Nielsen, who also required urgent psychiatric help following the accident. However, he received no response. This now leads to a shocking twist in the story. Vitaly Kaloyev held Peter Nielsen as an individual responsible for the deaths that night and for the death of his family. As a result, he contacted a private investigator to find Nielsen's home. On February 24, 2004, Kaloyev murdered Nielsen by stabbing him with a knife several times in his garden in the presence of his wife and children. He died a few minutes later. In October 2005, Kaloyev was convicted of premeditated killing and given eight years in prison, however was released in 2007 on the grounds that he was mentally unstable and that wasn't considered during the trial. After his release, he returned to his home in North Ossetia, Russia, where he received a hero's welcome and to this day has no remorse for killing Peter Nielsen, quoting, I don't really take offense to people who call me a murderer. People who say that would betray their own children, their own motherland. I protected the honor of my children and the memory of my children. He's nobody to me. He's nobody to me. He was an idiot. And that's why he paid for it with his life. If he'd been smarter, it would have been like this. If he'd invited me to his house, the conversation would have happened in softer tones, and the tragedy might not have happened. <laughs>